Welcome to my review of and thoughts on Joyride, the 2001 movie. So, yeah, I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I really loved. There will be some jokes, none at the expense of minorities, and I will get into some serious topics. Now, if you're looking for a review that's like the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by little movies, because of that, it's not that much fun to watch today. Whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. I have not watched the sequels, I don't have access to them, and I'm not planning on changing either of those things. So before I get further into it, the top link in the description box will allow you to donate to the SAG After Strikers, please do so. And then there are some links to videos that help explain why this is such an important strike. I realize this video is long, I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time. So I started the video with a review where I'm almost definitely not going to spoil anything. If I decide to spoil something, I'm going to verbally warn before I do so, hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler, so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I'm the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. So this movie is rated R, and whenever a thriller is rated R, of course people want to know about the violence. There is some, this is not as, like, you know, it's not a psychological thriller, but, well, not only that. It's not quite a horror movie, but it does not, like, some, some people have expressed that they were frustrated with the lack of violence in this, and directed people to... I forget if it's one or both of the sequels. I can imagine those have more violence. I personally don't think this needed more violence, and I'm not, like, you know, I, I do think there are some movies that are better because of the violence. I'm a big fan of David Cronenberg, especially stuff like Videodrome and The Fly, which both gain tremendously from the really graphic body horror. There's nothing like that in this movie, and I don't really think it's missing it. There is a lot of profanity and let's see yeah that's basically you know and yeah the the there is enough violence that it got an R rating. It's not PG-13 violence, which I... That is one thing I will say. There's a lot of PG-13 movies I love, and I... Like I said, I don't think every movie needs violence. PG-13 movies that are like thrillers or even horror usually don't have the, the violence to push as hard, and it just ends up feeling, feeling awkward. Although, in more recent years, PG-13 has been pushed... But yeah, I, I'm glad that this is rated R. I think that was the right choice. And yeah, so I've watched this at least twice. I am not sure that it's more than that. Um, I first watched this in 2004, so three years after it first came out. And again, you know, just now, I just got done watching, like as soon as the credits had run entirely. I hit record on this video, so it's very fresh in my mind. I'm not sure I've watched it in between. It's possible. I, f I forget. I might have, like, was it maybe, like, I was I was definitely watching some, that, that was back when Blockbuster had, like, physical locations, and you could get, I might have had it for, like, a couple of days and watched it multiple times with a friend of mine. We watched a lot of movies like this at the at the time. Now, the plot. I'm going to be quoting some from IMDb here. Three young people on a road trip from Colorado to New Jersey talk to a trucker on their CB radio. And... Yeah, he turns out to be dangerous. Let's go with that. And... Yeah, the... the Right, so I watched this on Disney Plus, and I've seen some people, you know, not not for this specifically, but for other R-rated stuff. I've I've seen people express that they, you know, they don't think that stuff like that 
should be on Disney Plus. Keep in mind, it is behind an age lock, which means if you're in a place where it's possible that children or teenagers will try to watch something on Disney Plus, you can password protect this and anything else above a certain age rating. The same thing goes for, for example, the Netflix Marvel shows, which are for adults, even though most of what Disney has made that's MCU is for teenagers. And let's see. Yeah, so let's get into the writing. So this was written by Clay Tarver and J.J. Abrams. And I got to admit, I'm really not particularly familiar with Clay Tarver, um, yeah, you know, other than this, he wrote Vacation Friends, and he's got a, based on characters created by, you know, credit for both of the sequels to this and the second Vacation, oh, and the second Vacation Friends movie he also wrote, and he wrote five episodes of Silicon Valley, the, um, the comedy show that criticizes, like, yeah, the, the um, yeah, I think, I, I don't think I need to explain that one further, I, it's fairly popular. Uh, right, he's directed one episode of Silicon Valley, two episodes of Upright Citizens Brigade, um, midi, a, a video thing called Meet Me at the Wreck, from 2014, and uh, yeah, he he directed both Vacation Friends movies. Yeah, I I'm not familiar with anything he's made other than this. Now J.J. Abrams, I'm not the biggest fan of. I am very familiar with his work. Um, suffice it to say, I think he has a lot of talent. And when he is, like, when he's writing and or directing something where he's allowed a lot of freedom to really indulge in his worst tendencies, it can sometimes end up very frustrating, but in the short term also very satisfying. And this is one of those things, you know, this, this was a part of his career, like, the same year that this it came out, you know, um, Alias first went on the, the air, which he created. Now, before that, he had already created Felicity, but I'm not sure that that, I, you know, I haven't watched Felicity. I'm not, I, I, I'm not going to be criticizing it. I know almost nothing about it. From what I understand is all I'll say it seems like that one was very much for like young women and that's great I I think there's I I don't know I wish there wasn't such a stigma for stuff that's primarily created for them however because of that I don't think that one made him as big of a household name as alias which essentially like alias you know, don't show it to, like, a kid. You know, you should be at least a teenager before you start watching. But, yeah, like, if you're a teenager or above, there's definitely something in that show that you can really get into. Like, you know, if you're, like, a senior citizen, you might struggle to keep up with some of the stuff go that goes on in the show. But you're probably going to appreciate some of, like, they bring back some some actors that, like, you know, because of their age, they don't get to be in as much stuff anymore, or, or didn't at the time, you know, but it's super cool to see them. They're still really talented. You know, it's, yeah, there's there's stuff for pretty much everyone above the age of, of you know, once once you're a teenager and, and aged up. There's, there's something on that show that you can really get into, and it's, of course, also, it was this kind of, ag you know, maybe not action, ten tension, suspense, mystery, spy, thriller. Those are, you know, popular, especially when you do it as well as Alias, you know, and, yeah, um, since then, I'm not sure that he's really had to take on 
stuff that he didn't like really really badly want to yeah looking across his he hasn't really written anything that he didn't super want to this like you know the writing for it is pretty good but it's not up to the standard of the stuff he's written since you know but yeah this was this was just a couple of years after he wrote Armageddon um which you know uh, uh, not by himself to to be clear uh let's see he yeah he wrote the screenplay with Jonathan Hensley who you know him I think I I've, I've never seen him write something oh wait that's right he wrote next other than next and he didn't write that by himself other than that you know that and Armageddon are ba are the only things I know that he's written where it's like okay that was very much just you know like I think he did fantastic on the Punisher both writing and directing anyway um yeah and the uh, let's see Jonathan Hensley Robert Roy Poole are credited with the story Tony Gilroy and Shane Salerno credited with the adaptation for Armageddon but yeah um I'm not going to go off on a rant on Armageddon, I swear. Because these movies don't have that much in common other than the the same writer. One of the same writers. But yeah, this was very much during the time, you know, like if you didn't know, I'm I can imagine some people might be watching this video right now going JJ wrote Armageddon because it doesn't feel very much like a J it's it's very Mark, Michael Bay, you know, and yeah, it was very, it was very mercenary job kind of, you know, writer for hire thing. Uh, I have to admit, I don't really remember Forever Young. I I thought it was fine. I I remember it as being fine. You know, Gone Fishing, complete disaster. Um, he wasn't the only writer for that. Uh, Jill Mazursky also helped write that. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know what I. I think Film Brain did a, a very good review taking apart Gone Fishing. It's 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 fascinating because like these are these are actors that are so much more talented than the the yeah. Anyway, so this was this was basically the last thing that JJ wrote before he made it big, and. Some of his writing here does really resemble the the later stuff. You know, the you have fairly clear, easy to understand characters. The the dialogue is very crisp, memorable, quotable, and there's a lot of you know dialogue and and just little character traits that pretty quickly give you an idea of who these people are and what they're about. And let's see. Uh, right, right. The so yeah, critic quote. J.J. Abrams is one of the writers. Maybe that is a reason why this film feels different. It doesn't have that cookie cutter routine genre feel to it. J.J. Abrams is the type of guy who would bring something fresh and new to a table full of tired and old. Yeah, this was from before he made Rise of Skywalker. And yeah, so the let's see. yes, so it was directed by John Dahl, and I have to admit, I'm really not familiar with like I I know that ah oh, that's right, he directed two episodes of Iron Fist. Was it two of the good ones? No, it was the two worst ones. It was the first two. Oh, but he did direct an episode of Jessica Jones, season one, episode nine. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty much all. Of season one was was really solid, in in general, really solid uh, show. He direct, yeah, he directed sixteen episodes of Dexter, also fairly solid show. Some weak points. Yeah, he's directed a lot of of TV. One episode of Breaking Bad. Let's see. What's the Great Raid? I don't remember that. I apparently watched it. Um, 
Yeah, sounds like a fascinating. It's a World War II story. I mean, I know these actors, but I don't remember seeing them in anything together. James Franco and Joseph Fiennes were in, were in the same movie? Anyway. Um, but I do hear, you know, a number of people recommend Red Rock West, also by John Dahl. And, uh, yeah, a crime drama thriller starring Nicolas Cage, Dennis Hopper, Larry Flynn Boyle. And that was, you know, in, in a number of reviews of this, people would say, you know, I was hoping this would be as good as Red Rock West. That was part of why they watched it. He does a really solid job. He, he appreciates how much of this is about the the tension and the the gradual buildup he doesn't try to flash it up which was a big problem in the early 2000s like if you go back and what you know i it's not something i'm recommending but if you if you feel like punishing yourself there's a lot of thrillers from the early 2000s with like flashy editing and just really you know really obnoxious stuff and and this does not have that you know there are there are times where it is just a few people and just conversation but because of what's said because of the implication it's very very tense and and just he he does not feel like he's bored doing that he he clearly understands this is some of the best of the movie you know and when there is like threat like it's not a spoiler to say that there are shots in this where a massive truck is like this source of danger and he films it exactly right he makes it look just humongous like he's he's filming this thing like it's a t-rex like just you know get away get away now this is this is incredibly dangerous kind of stuff you know he completely understands how to to approach this now fairly early in the movie uh, Fuller, the Steve Zahn uh, brother, says they didn't have a happy childhood, which explains his behavior, which gets him thrown in jail. And the prank call, not that only people like that do prank calls, but he is the one egging on the brother played by Paul Walker, R.I.P., named Lewis. So this movie is sort of like a marriage between Duel, wherein a trucker stalks the protagonist, and Phone Booth, wherein an unseen dangerous antagonist verbally torments a protagonist who can't escape him, saying he's going to teach him a lesson involving people he cares about. And, you know, I've seen some people say, oh, it's just a ripoff of Duel. To be clear, Duel is amazing. If you haven't watched that movie, like, you know, obviously, yeah, it takes a... It takes a kind of patience that we don't have enough of today. You know, it's from... Seven, uh, hold on. The movie Duel is from 1971. You know, and it is a TV movie, but it's Spielberg. It's written by Richard Matheson, R.I.P. You know, just, like, phenomenal. Yeah, it's... it's if you If you believe you have the patience for it, it's well worth your time. However, that movie does not have the phone booth element. And then there's also, of course, the fact, you know, this movie being released 30 years later, it, and during the 2000s, it's fairly roided up. You know, it's, it is dual on steroids. And that doesn't mean that dual wasn't good enough, but I do think that this movie was worth making for that, uh, you know, and, you know, that, that does, of course, bring up where Duel basically, like, there's not really anything in that entire movie that you couldn't, like, rationally explain as, you know, like, that movie takes place in the real world, pretty much. It's, it's at least very, very close to it. You know, that's also, like, in the 70s, you know, a lot of the thrillers from that period were very focused on the the verisimilitude of just it, it it's supposed to feel real that was something that was thought to be very scary back then which you know today 
Well, I suppose today there is a, some resurgence of of that sense that that if something is close to being real, you know. But yeah, we went through a period where there was a bit more. You know, the '80s were very much a decade of excess. The '90s were the extreme decade. The early 2000s still had some of that with extreme sports themed movies and such, you know. So yeah, this is, and, and that's another thing, this does not go overboard, in my opinion. This, you know, there are no extreme sports in this. This does not have, like, the kind of ridiculous stuff that you'd see in, you know, and that's another thing I think that J.J. brings to it because, like, you know, love him or hate him, he clearly has an appreciation for the kind of stuff that he grew up on in a way that there are a number of filmmakers today that don't you know it, it, but yeah him quentin tarantino christopher nolan they still really appreciate the kind of stuff they grew up on but you know a number of i don't think i want to name names but an, there are a number of movies being made today where you can tell they don't really yeah. Maybe Zack Snyder's one of them. They're, they they don't really appreciate the, the cinema that came before they got a chance to start making movies. You know, if you compare Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead to the Romero, George A. Romero Dawn of the Dead, you know, you can you can clearly see I I Maggie Mayfish did an excellent video on his on you know on Snyder's Dawn of the Dead. I will direct you to that one instead of going off on a thing about it here. But yeah, um, you know, this one understands that sometimes, like, there is, you know, it can be incredibly tense to just hear someone that you can't see and to be attacked by something so much bigger heavier and faster than you like a truck you know it, it you don't have to go all crazy with it you can just present that you know the the truck can't drive faster than a truck can in real life it's not bigger than a truck is in real life it might feel it at times but you know so yeah I'm yeah really really did a, a great job with with that now, you know, I think we all find some threat in those giant trucks. Like, there's a bunch of stories, including several movies, where the threat, or one of them, is a truck, you know. And this is one of the ones you can somewhat take seriously, maybe because it wasn't made by a coked-up Stephen King. But yes, um, I've been dancing around it for a little while. Yes, there are definitely things in this movie, in this movie that I'm talking about right now, that you cannot really explain. The movie doesn't even really try. It's not the kind of thing where, you know, the movie's like, oh, well, you know, if you think about this and then this, and, and you as the audience are like, bullshit. No, it, it doesn't even try. And that's the thing with thrillers and, you know, especially horror movies, sometimes the explanation actually takes away from it instead of, you know, making it feel even more compelling. And I think this is one of those cases where, like, I can easily imagine, you know, you could you could do a quick rewrite and have a scene where stuff is explained, and I really don't think, you know, and that's also something that J.J. feels, like, it. I think there's a, a an argument to be made that J.J. Abrams feels like explaining, you know, scenes that explain to you how this that and the other thing happened are like a personal insult like a like a fuck you to your face you know he he really really hates doing that and i think this is one of the movies that i can appreciate some people wish that it explained i think it works really well because it doesn't you know and that actually is like it's it's rare most of what he's written that didn't have explain like you know i suppose alias eventually did start explaining a lot and certainly some of lost they they did try to explain 
but a lot of those explanations were very underwhelming and I, th I think if Lost from the start had just been like, no, we're not explaining anything, I think it would have been a better show. But early on, they would promise in like interviews, everything's going to be explained. Everything you, know, everything you see on the show has an explanation, has a reason behind it. And so people got really hyped on that. And eventually, you know, I, I don't know. I think there's some chance that, you know, maybe they made a mistake in saying that. Maybe they didn't actually mean it. But when they finally got to explanations, you could tell this is not what they were planning all along. And I'm talking about Lost. Um, well, there goes the New Year's resolution. Anyway, yes, that is that is what I have to say about that. But but yeah, for sure, if you if it's very important to you that by the end of the movie things have been explained, this is probably not your movie. And you know, I get being frustrated by that. But again. You know, watch Duel. There's there's almost nothing in that that by the end of it you s still really don't. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, so let's see the. Um, uh, yeah. So the opening titles are are nice and and creepy, letting you know this is going to be a thriller, and then the first couple of scenes really don't deliver on that, which lulls, in part lulls you into a false sense of security, but also kind of, you know, it lets you know we're not, you know, what's the word? There will be you know, the, the, eventually these two will collide. The, the creepiness and the, the, this more relaxed tone where, like, Lewis is hoping that he'll be able to meet up with Venna. Uh, um, you know, they're, they're both in college, but different colleges. He's hoping that they can now be together because she just broke up with her boyfriend and basically I don't know if I want to give too much more away I'll, I'll just say you know it's yeah like if, you know the the you might be led to you know if you didn't watch the opening credits uh, you didn't watch the trailer or anything you might be lulled into believing Oh, this is like a road trip, like lighthearted teenage thing, you know. And yeah, that's that's not that is not what they were, you know, going for. So the the, the opening credits letting you know is is quite uh, it was the absolutely the the right choice. Now, I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits what came before. I kind of love the, the ending. I think it's it's practically perfect, ex exactly what I want. You know, this second viewing, like I did, or yeah, this view, this most recent viewing, I knew exactly what was happening. I remembered every detail. Like, I didn't, I wasn't sure I did, but by the end of having watched the ending, I was like, yeah, I... You know, all of that was was pretty burned into my mind, and it was still incredibly effective. Now, a number of user reviewers really, really hated that, hated the ending. Now, I think that might be more or less... So, um, right, so this, the, this movie's budget was 23 mil and, let's see, okay, it grossed around 36 mil, so 
uh, was this back when that was considered enough for profit? I forget. Um, I forget when that changed. But it's definitely, you know, it's very crowd-pleasing, so you can see how a lot of people went in. You know, I, th I think it might have... I, I'm not sure that the cast... You know, so, some of these were, like, up-and-comer Steve Zahn who plays Fuller, the, the brother of Lewis, you know, he's he's being in the movie, but he was known for comedies at the time. He does do some comedy stuff in this. Uh, I think this was before Paul Walker was a really big deal, because, like, that... I feel like that was something that happened... It's probably... Yeah, this was the same year as Fast and Furious... And then, you know, yeah, he was he was big in in those and had some other. So, um, and I think was this not? I think this was also as um, Lily Sobieski plays Vena. You know, she was also just coming up. Um, and this is also. Oh, that's right. She had done the Joan of Arc miniseries already. Um, yeah, you know, she appeared in Eyes Wide Shut, and she has very little screen time in that. But this was also the same year as The Glass House, which I think made her a bigger... Oh, yeah, she is in Max. I could watch that again. It's been a while. But, but yeah, um... And this, I, I don't think this movie really does her talents justice, but, you know, this was also early in her career. A lot of people didn't fully realize her talent yet. Um, I have more to say, but I'll talk about it in the spoiler sections, because, yeah, I would have to get into spoilers. Now... That brings us to the filming location. So yeah, this was filmed on on location. Let's see. Uh, yeah, the the interstate of Interstate 80 of Nevada, various other places around Nevada, including yeah, there's there's some. There's at least one scene at a motel, and that was actually, at least part of it, was shot on location. And, yeah, for the university, they also did some location... For one of the universities, they did location shooting. And, yeah, truck stops, various... Yeah, and, and you know... They they get yeah they they went to to Utah they got some really really great like some places with personality you know it really feels like you know because like obviously we know you know it was it was a movie they didn't actually just drive the the exact distance that you know that you know they would they would drive the the crew and and the car to the place where they would film. And then they would film there, but they were, you know, they were careful to select some really photogenic places. And, you know, it's it's probably one of those where you can't literally just drive, you know, in case you wanted to recreate, you know, you wouldn't be driving in a straight line because they, they went a couple of different places that were a little out of the way because it was worth it because these places looked amazing on camera, you know. But, but yeah, they did a really great job with that. There's also some people cast, uh, you know, who really add a lot of personality to it. A, you know, some great faces. I think it was Kyle Caldron who's, in, when he was talking about the name of the rose, you know, he talked about why, why don't we still have character actors with faces with personality? In, in movies, that was, and, and this is one of the ones that has it, and again, you know, well, I suppose it's possible that J.J. as a writer couldn't necessarily have had, but I could imagine, you know, he's, his screenplays are often very detailed, I could imagine he wrote in the screenplay, you know, the sheriff 
has a face that's seen a thousand miles or something, you know, and yeah, like they they really did a, a solid job on the the casting. The music was handled by Marco Beltrami, and he is of course quite well known. He has three upcoming and 146 completed credits as composer and yeah he's done he's done of he's done horror he's done other thrillers and he absolutely understands how to to like the kind of notes that really get to you that really get you on edge and he does a really great job with that and the soundtrack also really feels like you know some of it is like stuff they would be listening to on the road which you know again very similitude uh, there's some quite good sound design. I don't know if I can really get into details. Right, um, yeah, so the CB radio is how they contact this trucker. And I don't know if there is as much static on a real CB radio as there is on the, you know, which again, they don't push it too hard, you know, but the static really adds a lot. You know, like, there's a... I, I realize not everybody had, like, a cell phone back in 2001, but, you know, like, yeah, hypothetically, if you were to make this same movie... Yeah, actually, didn't they just... There's, like, a... There's a Liam Neeson movie coming out that has, you know, someone be contacted on his cell phone in his own car, you know, and, yeah, just without static, it's just not the same. It doesn't quite have, you know, at one point, Fuller refers to CB radio as a sort of prehistoric internet, and that really is the, the vibe you get. Now, the movie is 93 minutes without end credits and 97 with them. And there's not really anything in the end credits you don't, that you need to see. You can just stop watching when you get there. And, yeah, that is... Right, so I have some, yeah, I have some um, quotes from critics and user reviews. So, let's get into those. Let's see... While it's not perfect, Joyride manages to steer us in the direction of a memorable villain and an incredibly suspenseful climax. Its use of female characters hasn't aged particularly well, but this high-octane highway horror has great action, particularly the climax. The ties to gay panic, hate crimes, and Matthew Shepard's death only makes Joyride more interesting. Boasts a number of genuinely exhilarating sequences and set pieces. Yeah, if you've watched this movie already, cornfield if you haven't yeah be you know that's that's a scene to look out for <laughs> will convince you you'd be better off taking the train america's dark and lonely back roads are the prime location for stories about relentless psychotic stalkers preying on the youth absolutely true it really is like there's a, there's a one point in this movie where a character says if someone tried to, they would never be able to find us out here, you know, and it's very, very true. It's, you know, I, I've i never been on the those back roads, and that's something I'm glad about, because movies certainly do underline how isolated and just, like, you know, the, the thing is, let's say that you're dealing with a stalker and you're in a big city, you know, then, you know, maybe try to get to, like, the police or something, you know. If you're in a movie, they might help. If you're in real life, they probably wouldn't, unless you're rich. But, you know, that's, so, you know, when you see horror movies like that, they always have to have some reason why the police can't help or something. You know, if you're in the suburb, go to your neighbor. And that's also something, some horror, you know, yeah, I put Halloween behind me. You know, that's a movie where the suburb is not as safe as it might feel, you know. But those are those are always, they have to explain it. But on the back roads of America, it really is like, where are you going to go? You know, you can't, like, you're out in the middle of nowhere. There's no one and nowhere 
to go. You know, you, you basically just have to hope that you can get to somewhere that has some people in time. And if not, that's it. You're screwed. Let's see. One person says nothing special. It just devotedly does its job to give the audience a string of suspense scenarios. Entitled to their opinion. One person said it's suspenseless, which I don't know. I, you know, to each their own. I don't understand how you could feel that way. Let's see. The, this, the popcorn thriller manages to keep the viewers' disbelief at bay while offering a deceptively smooth ride through some frequently bumpy territory. That is, you know, it actually does pretty good at keeping you from asking the questions. Uh, you know, it, it moves just fast enough. And there's just enough, like, different things. You know, every so often something will happen that you did not see coming. Uh, you know, and that keeps you from, you know, it's, uh, uh, what's the, it's like fridge logic. You know, like, after watching later, then you realize, you know, oh, wait, that didn't really make sense. You know, but as you're watching it, yeah. It's a scary film, an atmospheric, unrelenting, character-rich thriller that includes one of the most jolting shock moments I can remember. Things were pushed over the top rather successfully. Let's see. It's what we don't see that terrifies us in Roadkill, which it's called in some countries. A blistering good thriller that keeps us uneasy and perched on the edge of our seats. A thriller driven by considerable suspense. This is a drive-in movie supreme, a suspense saga with several wicked shocks and at least as many hearty laughs. A galvanizing amusement park ride that only occasionally steps over the bounds of common sense. You'll feel like you're an unwilling passenger along for a bumpy ride in John Dahl's road rage thriller Joyride. Dahl dresses up this fuel-injected spectacle with silly-minded edge-of-your-seat fury. One of those rare movies that I know I shouldn't like, but I cannot help but enjoy it. Premium entertainment of the genre variety. If you're looking to have your nerves fried and your pulse pounded, this is your ticket to ride. 98 minutes of pure, unadulterated exhilaration. It's an easy film to critique for what it doesn't do, but what it does do very well is take you for a comically dark fantasy ride. Very well put. One thing I will also say... Um, I really don't think it needed to have as many offensive jokes as it does. Like, I, you know, I'm not saying that you can't do stuff like that at all, but it just felt like <sighs> there's a lot that, that Fuller says and does that's really, really offensive. And, you know, I, I mean, I think the idea is supposed to be, oh, you know, he's like you know, not quite a teenager, but like 20, he's in his 20s, he's, you know, he's a bad boy, he's gonna do, you know, I don't think they needed to have as many as they do, and it's also, it's, I suppose, there's a, there's a scene in this movie where another character is, saying and doing really offensive things and we're clearly supposed to hate that character and we do you know they succeed at that but it does feel very weird that we're you know we're given the go-ahead to hate him but fuller we're supposed to empathize with you know just I, th I think they push it too far and it also felt like they were just trying to push every like there's ableism racism uh, let's see, there is, like, transphobia, homophobia, um, let's see, misogyny, you know, pretty much everything that you could fit in there, you know, and a lot of it done by Fuller, and I just really don't think, because it, like, it doesn't even comment on all of these, like, if it, if it did, I'd be, you know, I'm, I've I've watched most of Scream Queens by now, and that's that has a lot of offensive material, but it's also like clever about it. It doesn't just feature a lot of really offensive stuff like this does. 
Back to credit quotes, Dahl works the audience like the dial of a car radio, testing out all manner of squeals and static and all-out high-pitched terror. This top thriller is sharply directed by John Dahl and benefits from fine low-key performances from Walker, Sobieski, and Zahn. Grounding the over-the-top antics is the genuine suspense, ups the fear factor by adding an anonymous figure, one that cannot be reasoned with, whose only goal is to get his hands on you. Dahl and scene stealer Steve Zahn deserve praise for breathing some entertaining new life into a generally stale genre. Since most thrillers ignore matters of logic, character, and pacing, Joyride is an innovation because it doesn't. An absolutely merciless thriller, exciting, marvelously crafted, strongly acted with more than a few moments destined to increase your heartbeat. People who are looking for a good scare with plenty of Steve Zahn laughs along the way will be satisfied. Whether or not the plot makes any sense, though, Dahl keeps an iron death grip on all of it, as if each scene were his last. Expertly toys with fear, any carbon-based life form feels when one of those Peterbilt express trains comes rolling by with a thundercrack of vibration at about 240 miles per hour, gently urging us to move right or die crushed and bleeding. One person says they're just driving and screaming and running, making the film come off as yet another teen scream sequel. Terrific escapist fare, stylish, outrageous, and compelling. Let's see. And it's so taut in its direction that you really don't notice the implausibilities and plot holes until the film's over. No one wins awards for movies like this, but this is escapist entertainment raised to the level of art. Well-performed, smartly staged B-movie romp that'll keep you on the edge of your seat and have your foot pushing a non-existent gas pedal. An edge of your seater that will have folks thinking twice before taking a road trip across America. Zahn's hilariously electric performance is the best thing in the movie. I will definitely say, you know, if you don't like him elsewhere, you're probably going to find Zahn annoying here. Um... He never shuts up. He he never stops talking, uh, pretty much. And when I say that, I actually do feel like, you know, it could have been worse. He could have been even more annoying. Like, certainly, you know, I don't know if I'd ever be able to sit through the entirety of National Security or Saving Silverman again. You know, but this and... Ah, crap. What is, what is it that it's called again? I'll have it momentarily um because it's him and it's that's it yeah sahara i could definitely and i hear hear good things about war for the planet of the apes his performance in that and let's see yeah, one person says you might not remember it 10 minutes later but while it's playing out joyride lives up to its title I already mentioned, I remembered a lot of it, you know, I I probably haven't watched it in almost 20 years, so, yeah. Let's see, nothing more or less than scary, noirish fun, low on thematic ambition, but giddily high on the fright front. Very true. Let's see. The best kind of B-movie, one that will have you ultimately laughing, squirming in your seat, and yelling at the screen. There's a perfect blend of comedy and terror, which makes the film riveting. Doll's been beaten down either by the idiot script or the idiot moneyman or both. Continually unnerves the audience while leaving conventional plot twists and hidden agendas in its rear view mirror. <laughs> yeah, one person said he was hoping that they would just be slaughtered. Let's see. Right, and I do want to... Yeah, um... The, um, oh, hold on. Actually, yeah, never mind. I, it's coming up. John Dole's Joyride is a hick thriller tailor made for the screen crowd. That is true. Uh, for better or for worse. Um, let's see. Joyride gets a lot more mileage from its attention grabbing pre premise than the recent Jeepers Creepers got from a similarly unsettling high concept. 100% agreed. And I actually, you know, like, I like 
Justin Long. So it was a surprise, the Jeepers Creepers. You know, but... You know, Jeepers Creepers is also the kind of thing where, like... I'm really glad that at least Victor Salva did do the time. You know, uh, certainly... Um, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. I'll have it um, momentarily. The, um, yeah, Roman Polanski did not. But, um, yeah, um, for those who might not know, Victor Salva. It's a, yeah, convicted child molester. And, yeah. Um, let's see. So yeah, I'm really, really glad that he did, at the very least, it's the bare minimum, is, is to do the time. Now, uh, let's see. Right, back to quote quotes. Built an incredible amount of tension and releases it with some startling violent encounters. Uh, let's see. There's something quite old-fashioned about this film. It wouldn't have seemed out of place in the 70s or even 80s. It makes the most out of the open road. And let's see. Redoubtedly hilarious as always, Zahn also lends his character unpredictable flashes of anger, pathos, and faint psychosis. Even when the movie jumps the median from ticklishly discomforting black cup into by the numbers horror jolts. In noir, everybody's guilty, and that's one of the pleasures of Joyride. The three youngsters aren't exactly innocent. Now, let's see. I think that might be... Um, right. Um, three different versions of the ending were shot. This is from IMDb Trivia. And the movie was renamed Roadkill in the UK since taking a joyride is not the pleasant journey it is in the state. Rather, the name for when youth steal cars and race each other or the cops. Drive rings at high speed and eventually total, usually setting it on fire and dump the car. Similarly, the film was also renamed Roadkill in Australia. And, uh, let's see. I think I want to put that in the spoiler section um, so yeah here we go right and Sylvester Stallone was considered for the role of Rusty Nail and honestly I I could see that uh, you know Stallone I wish that he had only ever played Rocky and Rambo because as it is now every time you talk about Stallone as an actor you kind of have to, well, also, you know, the stuff he's done with um, James Gunn, that as well, you know. But, yeah, so I'm referring to the times where he's really talented. So those three cases, yeah, I could I could actually see that in, yeah. And Eric Stoltz and Eric Roberts audition for the role of Rusty Nail. And, let's see. See. Yeah, and um, in the in the scene where uh, let's see, yeah, there are, you know there are, there's a scene where Lily Sobieski is supposedly drinking, but you can see that Lily Sobieski doesn't really take any of the drinks. This is because she would have been 17 or 18 at the time of filming under the US drinking age of 21 which is also you know pretty uncomfortable that they sexualize her although at least it's not as creepy as in eyes were wide shut where she was either you know she yeah she was between 12 and 15 i'm i'm not 100 you know that that movie was filmed between november of 96 and june of 98 so not 100% certain when her scenes were filmed 
Let's see. And that is also something that I want to get into in spoilers. There we go. Okay, um, let's see. I think that was... Right, yes. Um, the, the guy who's following them, his, his radio call sign is Rusty Nail. And the, the voice of Rusty Nail is that of, oh, yeah, Ted Levine. And, you know, this is, this is, of course, ten years after his incredibly memorable turn in The Sounds of the Lambs. And, yeah, just, you know, he's one of those actors, it feels like it should practically be a felony to not also have him on screen because he is a phenomenal physical actor, but his voice, even by itself, is really incredible, and he just, yeah, he does a fant fantastic job. Honestly, if they had cast someone who couldn't really make it work, the movie would simply not. Uh, it, it would fail right out of the gate, because his, you know, his his voice, just the general quality of it, because, you know, if you know what Ted Levine sounds like, he does, he sounds like he's seen some shit. You know, the voice is not like this pure, pleasant thing. You know, it, I'm not saying he has a bad voice. It's not like unpleasant, but just there's a, there's a raw quality to it, a, a hardened quality to it. So, so even right, you know, right out of the, right, you know, immediately, you have that element. But he is also both capable of, like, this somewhat soft-spoken and, like, not immediately intimidating kind of thing, you know, but also able to build it into something very, very you know, intense, and and if if not all of those aspects were present, it simply would not work, you know, but they, they yeah, they, clearly a lot of thought was put into who to, to cast for that, you know, and yeah, I... I think Stallone could have done a really good job. I don't think he would have been quite as good as Levine, but certainly he is capable of, you know, in, in the first, uh, the, so it's not called the first Rambo, the first Rambo movie called First Blood, you really, in that one, you do see, you know, some of the time he's, he's very friendly, even kind of goofy and corny, but other times he's very intense, you know, it, it shouldn't, it wouldn't be the same kind of like shouty performance as when he gets into, which is, you know, not saying that's a bad thing, but, you know, that wouldn't work for here. But I've seen Stallone do intense without shouting, you know, so, but, but yeah, really, really, you know, Ted Levine absolutely makes this movie. Now, that brings us into... The, hold on. There we go. So yeah, um, the best elements of this are the the way that it builds and maintains tension, the way that it isn't you know lost in these early two thousands tropes, and yeah, like. A dual movie for teens. You know, I, I'm sure there's a lot of teenagers who are not willing to go back and watch, you know, Duel. Let's see. And, and, you know, to be clear, I don't think that that's, like, I don't really blame teenagers for that. I think we got to get better at introducing young people to, you know, I'm very fortunate. When I was a kid, my parents were always showing me 
movies that, you know, they, they could have just been showing me movies that were recent, but they were showing me movies that were much, much older. You know, my father showed me a lot of movies from his youth, you know, from, from the 60s, and yeah, you know, I, I can sit down and watch a movie from almost any decade now because of that, and I don't blame people who haven't had that experience for not, because movie, you know, filmmaking has changed tremendously over decades, you know, over the, you know, yeah, we've been making movies for about a century now. If you go back and watch stuff from a century ago, it's it's completely different, you know. And it is an acquired taste, especially if you're, you know, it's easier to sit down and watch like a short film. But if you sit down, you know, if you, I, it, I will say it's been a, a little while and I now hear that some people think that it's, some people apparently read pro-fascism into the Fritz Lang movie Metropolis because one of the writers um, apparently was a or was it a, what whatever some someone working on it was actually yeah um, I I gotta say I always read it as much more like left leaning like pro union pro worker kind of thing not you know, but, I mean, I thinking about it, I guess I can kind of see what they, how how it could be read as being fascist. But, but yeah, you know, that movie, like, I have to admit, I've only watched the 90-minute version. I haven't watched the full 2-hour, 33-minute version. But, you know, I thought it was amazing, but obviously, if you're not used to that, it's it's incredibly different from, you know, like, if, if you look at, like, it's listed as sci-fi. It's incredibly different. And I mean, okay, sure, yeah. Like some of the some of the stuff you see in it, you know, it does have a robot. You know, some of the stuff is very sci-fi, but it's incredibly different sci-fi from what we're used to today. You know, so yeah. Um, let's see now. Um, yeah, so the worst aspects are the, you know, the unchecked offensive material, the 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 lack of diversity. Yeah, like you could easily make at least one of the characters POC and or LGBTQIA plus. And um, yeah, so the something that came up as negative in a lot of other reviews was the the realism thing I was most worried about was definitely Steve Zahn. Uh, he's not that. He's he's fine in it compared to other stuff. Like, yeah. Um, right, and I do, do want to make clear, you know, the, the worst aspects I mentioned, I really, it, it doesn't ruin the movie. And I do realize, you know, back then it wasn't... there were different expectations you know people thought that you know we gotta put white guys in the movie or white guys won't watch the movie and everybody else just has to somehow be able to relate more to white guys than people who are more like them the thing I was most looking forward to was Ted Levine and he absolutely knocks it out the park it's just absolutely incredible like honestly if you're a fan of his, if you're a big fan of his performances, I would say it's pretty much worth watching just to to listen to his voice and and performance. Just yeah. Now the trailer does give too much away. Uh, it is old. Like if you like the trailer, you probably will like the movie also. Um, but yeah, I do. You know, and and I do think you know if you. If you watch the movie and like it, you know, I do recommend watching the trailer afterwards. I don't really recommend watching it before because it just, it gives away way too much. Or, unless you're one of those people, like, it's it's great if you can watch the trailer that has a lot of spoilers and watch the movie and just not be thinking, oh, I, you know, well, that thing from the trailer hasn't happened yet, so it must be coming up. The cover and poster don't give too much away and give you a decent idea of what the movie is like. As much as, you know, 
a, a still can. Now on Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 74% on the tomato meter. Uh, 116 reviews, 30 of them rotten. The average rating is 6.60 out of 10. I have to admit, when I real when I saw that this was on Disney Plus, I was expecting it to have a lower rating. Like, I would definitely have guessed somewhere in the 60s, maybe even slightly lower than that. But yeah, you know that's and that's the thing. You know they were just positive enough. You know it doesn't mean that. 116 reviewers thought, oh, the movie's like a 7 out of 10. Now, uh, let's see. And, and that's also, you know, some for some people, a 7 out of 10 is like, oh, you got to watch it. And for others, it's like, you no, well, find something better. And the audience score, based on 50, more than 50,000 ratings, is 66%. Uh, the average rating is 3.6 out of 5. The consensus, a well-constructed B-movie thriller, Joyride keeps up the necessary level of tension and thrills. Critics also liked Zahn's performance as the goofball older brother. Let's see. Yeah, and uh, some of what it's compared to on Rotten Tomatoes is Wild Things, 8mm Stigmata, Premonition, and The Watcher. And yeah, Wild Things and 8mm are definitely, like, they're watchable enough. Um, but I would definitely say they're some of the, yeah, they, they have elements of being over-directed and over-edited. Now, on Metacritic, it has a 75 out of 100 from critics. Based on 31 reviews, uh, 25 of them positive, six, six that are mixed, and let's see. Yeah, one one of the mixed says the movie is a yawn, and yeah, one one says Doll really does know what he's doing. One says pure, irrational, claustrophobic, gritty, unpretentious. And yeah, one of them did not like something about the ending, but did say otherwise it's a neatly constructed nail biter. One person said at some point in this endless thriller, the suspense turns into an extremely unpleasant ordeal. The doll doesn't know when to stop. I, I disagree. I think that, you know, it's very much, it's made for, like, teenagers and 20-somethings, and there's just, you know, I vaguely remember being that age, and, yeah, just, you know, you can you can push it very, very far, very hard, and it's still, like, okay. It's not excessive. And, yeah, the the last of the mixed review says it does take viewers on one hell of a ride it takes an overused plot breathes some sort of creativity into it so yeah like nobody on nobody seemed to really hate it none of the critics on Metacritic really hated it it has an 8.2 out of 10 based uh, uh, from um, users on Metacritic based on 175 ratings 146 positive, 16 mixed, 13 negative, and let's see. Um, yeah, one person says, one person that really hated it said it was a bore. Um, One person says that the ending was such a letdown that it really, um, yeah, that it ruined the rest of the movie for them. Um, one mixed says it doesn't really make sense, but possibly above, class above. Um, yeah, and the rest of the reviews are positive. Well, there's one that's like negative, but it's French, and I don't really do 
I, I don't, you know, I realize I could put that through Google Translate, but I am not really fond of doing that. You know, grammar gets lost in the translation. Now, um, there are on IMDb no less than 394 user reviews, 327 if you hide spoilers. I read the top 100 voted most useful of, of the ones with spoilers as well. Uh, three of them gave it one out of ten, another three gave it two, another three gave it three, seven gave it four, sixteen gave it five, thirteen gave it six, nineteen gave it seven, nineteen gave it eight, four gave it nine, three gave it ten. So yeah, largely very positively received and so the special effects are largely practical and that really helps a lot like you know there clearly was actually a truck hitting stuff in in some of these scenes you know I I, I don't know if I, I guess it probably would have like uh, to to animate an entire truck in CG might have been out of the. I I don't know if it was a financial decision or not, but I definitely think they made the right choice, and the the violent stuff also tends to be practical. Uh, I actually I don't think there was any like CG of when when it came to violence. And yeah, there's just, you know, it has a stronger effect. You know, I, I, whenever you can go practical, you, you should, in my opinion. Now, that is pretty much right. And uh, so, yeah, on, on Disney Plus, the suggested section features. Max Payne. I don't know why you'd want anyone to watch that, but anyway, The Drop, the first Transporter movie, Unstoppable, the first Die Hard movie. Yeah, I suppose there's a certain yeah, What Lies Beneath, Marked for Death, and Phone Booth. So I guess they don't have Duel, because that's uh, yeah, they don't. That that seems like a real obvious recommendation to make. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, I rate this seven taunts of a psycho truck driver out of ten. And yeah, uh, it has aged quite well, you know, as I mentioned, this movie is now 22 years old, and yeah, um, there's not much, like, it is, it is of its time, uh, you know, if you're gonna watch it today, you know, you might be surprised by how much, like, you know, for something so mainstream to have as many, like, offensive, <sighs> yeah, um, I think... Yeah, I think the the reception, the the popularity of it, the that is about at the level that it deserves, pretty much. And that brings us into the spoiler section. So, starting with notes taken while watching. So yeah, um, really really great opening with the creepy footage on like CB radios. And like lights, and you kind of get a sense, like it's almost like POV of Rusty Nail. It's like this is why he's so crazy. He's he's just completely lost it from all this, you know, just he, you know, no human contact. The only way he can have anything to do with other people is this radio. And when he does, he's talking about how much he likes the rain. He likes that people stay inside and this stuff. And let's see. 
yeah, and and um, then you get the uh, what's it called? Oh, right. I want to to briefly. Um, yeah, one one thing that you know, this thing of the. Uh, let's see. One one reviewer, you know, pointed out. Um, Retnakes take a beating in the script. Doll depicts them as Neanderthal types who lack sexual savoir faire. And um, let's see, when Lewis addresses Rusty on his candy cane voice, Rusty hesitates when Candy asks him what he would do after she unbuttoned her blouse. The guys get a great laugh out of Rusty's sexual repressive personality. Let's see, and. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, Vena is on the phone with uh, uh, Lewis, and you know he lies and claims he has a car, and we see you know the the you know he was going to take the the a plane, but you know the ticket. Yeah, he he gets a car instead. And Fuller says that Lewis friend zoned, that that uh, Vena friend zoned Lewis, and I do appreciate that Lewis gets really angry with him for that. I and and yeah, I know he doesn't use the term friend zone. I don't think that had been invented at the time. You know, today, thankfully, we realize that friend zone is bullshit. See, and it really it's it speaks more ill of the person who thinks of friendship with a woman as like a letdown than you know just yeah and yeah you know fuller small talks with everyone the cop as he's being released the mechanic and just uh, yeah and yeah, Fuller goads Lewis into the the CB prank, punches his shoulder. You know, I appreciate that Lewis doesn't do it just like immediately. And then when he, you know, when when Lewis is doing the the candy cane voice and saying some things, you know, Fuller's like, "Now you're turning me on, and you never slept with your sister, right?" Was that just a thing? Did did JJ just like putting incest jokes in in his scripts? I mean, despite all the the opportunities for that sort of thing, he didn't put it in either of his Star Wars movies. And that's a pretty like you know, the protagonist. Not like you know, there were there were some kisses in the original trilogy, but anyway. And I I really appreciate that we never get a really super clear look at Rusty Nail. You know, we it's always slightly obscured, and we see like part of his face or something. And the fact that he does have a physical in-person presence. You know, near the end, I, I really thought that was the, the right choice. You know, there are some movies like this where that never happens, and I don't know that it's always the wrong choice, but I do think that it's a loss. Like, there is just something, as scary as a big car is, there's just something about, like, someone, like, physically grabbing you that's very, very intimidating. I really love that we don't see the attack on the the douche in room 17. We just we hear some some audio and it's just vague, you know, you know. And you know, in order to keep the the scene like from just being bland or boring, the camera slowly zooms in on this painting that the brothers are standing next to to try to listen to room 17. You know, that was a really really great choice and also just the painting itself like I'm not great at like analyzing still media but yeah you know the the 
like it wouldn't work if it was like a big happy picture or something but it is there is this sense of sort of loneliness and and solitude you know this this one boat off on the on the water you know which you know it is this solitude that's driving the rusty nail let's see and um Right, and, and, yeah, I did already talk some about, like, you know, the sheriff has real personality, and just, yeah, the, the, you know, yeah, we, we basically, we meet, like, the sheriff is the guy with the mustache, but there's also the other guy with the big teeth, there's got this, this, you know, thing that he's chewing on right in the side, and he's, got a situation you know just great you know really really feels like the the kind of you know it's it's very stereotypical you know JJ is not really ashamed to trade and stereotypes and yeah and then you know Rusty Nail on the you know contacts them again on the CB and reveals that he's following them you know you really should get that fixed fix what your tail light and it's just like ah you know just really really <laughs> just yeah I, I don't think I mean if you do it right that will always be a really compelling like the reveal that someone dangerous is looking at you right now and you didn't even know it you know it's like it's also really effective in phone booth and you know, there are, yeah, Halloween has some really great, the original, you know, and, and some in the, yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of the sequels, but the, yeah, yeah, some in the more recent, in the, in the H40 trilogy are also, anyway, um, but, but yeah, you know, the thing with the taillight was great setup and payoff, and that's something that J.J., does really excel at when you know because you know the the guy pulls you know the the cop pulls him over and he's like I'm sorry I know I made an illegal u-turn but it came from the right place you know and and the cops like I'm also writing you up for your busted tail light so you know you remember oh he has a busted tail light and then when rusty nail calls it out it doesn't come out of it. you know imagine if that was the first time the busted taillight came out it was like i have a busted tail light? what you know but also when you know when he's when lewis hears that he's like i have one of those you know he clearly he's not a car person so he didn't even notice that the you know so so that's a great little yeah and they're followed by one trucker. Ice truck killer? I mean, is the ice truck trucker a killer? And, you know, I, I, it's great that, you know, he's got the, the thing, and it looks like a baseball bat. It's like, oh, he's going to, you know, he's, he's going to hit someone in the face with that thing. That's where our mind is going, you know. And he, he goes up, he gets real close to Lewis, and, like, looking very, you know, like, it's not really that, like, oh, his eyes, like, no, no, like, it's the fact that we see, like, the reflection of him, and he's, like, a little warped, and, you know, Lewis runs out of there, and, you know, he comes running out, and he's got the thing in his hand, and we're like, ah, oh, he's gonna try to catch up to them and beat them to death, you know, and then when he finally does catch up to them, he's like, you know, they, you know, got a gun, and I got a MasterCard, you know, which is a very JJ exchange, and... Yeah, it's like, no, no, this, this isn't, it's just checking tire pressure. I'm just checking tire pressure, you know. Oh, this, okay, you know. Is it the mustache? My wife's keep telling me to shave it off, you know, and just, you know. And, and once he's talking, like, he seems just this really chill, gentle guy. So that's a really great, just, you know, if, this would be, it, it wouldn't work anywhere near as well if they kept trying to make him, like really intense and creepy or something, you know. And and then, you know, as he's driving off, Rusty Nail 
slams through the truck, which I I appreciate that apparently Rusty Nails truck is made out of adamantium or something like it it can drive through anything and take no significant damage of its own you know it's just it's completely ridiculous and I love it and yeah so the first real truck attack is 43 minutes in you know until then they built up to it and he does actually really wreck the car crushing it against the tree and then you know, they're like, I'm sorry, we're just doing it for a laugh. Well, me too. Have a nice time. You know, just like, okay, bye. Let's see. Yeah, and it's, I already mentioned the review, but it really is uncomfortable how much the camera objectifies Vena. This is the part where you kiss the girl. Okay, calm down. Sebastian, is he in the scene with the Little Mermaid? Anyway. And, yeah, you know, the, the character of Venna is really underserved. And it's very undeserved because, you know, Billy Sobieski, excellent actress. You know, the, the and, and just in general, you know, I don't really like when female characters are this. Like, she's basically just the cool girl. She's there to be attractive and attacked. And actually, the... Let's see, I'm going to say it was MDB Trivia. There's, um... Oh, right, and and the... Yeah, now that I'm talking... Um, spoilers, you know, I, I did mention that the, um... What's it called? Um... I mentioned that there's multiple deleted, you know... It actually, there are, uh, let's see, yeah, there were, uh, what does that say? I think it's like four different overall alternate and, four, four endings in total, so I guess three alternate endings. And there's actually, the only one where Rusty Nail survives the entire movie is the, the one that is the actual, you know, the one that they went with, and I think that's exactly right. I don't think the movie should end with Rusty Neal dying. You know, it's just, it's not as scary if he survives. Right, and, um, yeah, the thing with the ice truck, that's actually a reference to Duel. Oh, right, and the, yeah, the car they're driving in this movie is a 1971 Chrysler Newport. And... Um, I could swear. Oh, in the diner scene when Paul Walker and Steve Zahn are naked, you can hear Rusty Nail laughing loudly and maniacally as they run back out to the car. Now, right, and at one point a trucker says, there's a Kojak with a Kodak, which is CB slang for a cop with a radar because of the cop show Kojak and Kodak, the film company and and the this movie was actually shot on Kodak film right and there was a clown named Rusty Nails was the inspiration for Crusty the Clown of the Simpsons there's also an actor named Rusty Nails and a director named Rusty Nails and I would love to be able to say accurately that all three of them were in this that would be amazing but unfortunately no um I swear it's here somewhere. Let's see. Um. Hmm. I guess. Okay, I, I apparently can't find... Oh, right, the, the various... The, the um, IMDb goof section is worth looking through. I don't really have anything to add to the various things they note. Um, 
Anyway, um, back to my notes. Yeah, and you know, in the oh, right, right now I remember the yeah. I'll just I'll I'll say from from memory. Apparently, like there were scenes shot and ultimately cut. One where Venna sleeps with Fuller, and one where Venna sleeps with Lewis, and you know, as it is now in the film, she flirts with both, but ultimately isn't seen to to you know, consummate with with either, and the, the, um, yeah, it's, um, it really does tell you that that is basically, like, she, her character exists to be lusted after by boys, and, you know, in the, in the motel room, she says, no one could find us. Even if they look in the foreshadow of Death Valley. And then Rusty gets on the phone and he gets them their radio back and talks about one of them jaw jars. Makes them streak, which, you know, honestly, with how much the camera objectifies Venna, I really don't see any reason why, you know. Anyone attracted to men shouldn't also get some some eye candy. Let's see. And yeah, and you know, on on the on the radio, I think what you know, uh, Rusty Nail talks about his frustration with you know standing there holding the bottle in his hand, which I guess that's one way to put it. And let's see. yeah, the the cornfield scene is just incredible. Like the 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 fact that you like there's this there's this illusion of being able to get away because how could he possibly see, especially when they're like crawling? But they can't be crawling all the time because it's driving after them. You know, eventually it'll hit them. You know, just yeah, some some really great stuff. It's it's a very clever set piece. It's so much more effective than if they were just in a in like a barren field, and it was easy to see where they were because then it'd be like, well, Rusty Nail can see. You know, even even if they all three of them split up, he's just gonna he's gonna follow one of them. What are the other two gonna do? You know, he might have a gun in there. Apparently, he does. You know, he certainly later he has a shotgun. What what are they gonna be able to do that? You know, so so the fact that and and at one point they're like lying on the ground, he drives over, but they're like, or yeah, they're in like a, a trench in the ground, you know, kind of thing. So they they don't get hit. Just really, really great, intense stuff. But but yeah, you know, for coming out the same year as Alias, yeah, that's the thing. I I just read that it was filmed between ninety nine and two thousand one. So yeah, you know, at this point. Alias had not gotten off the ground it, it, before this movie was released. Uh, during production, at least, it hadn't got off the ground yet. Um, but, but yeah, you know, on Alias, uh, JJ was able to deliver much more complex female characters. This is more like Armageddon and other early JJ writing for females. And of course, there are the issues. You know, how could this big truck sneak up on people? How, how does Rusty Nail know? how to find the brothers, how does he know they are brothers, how does he know their names, all this stuff. And it's the kind of thing where, you know, if you explain these things, it's just, you know, the, the yeah, it, if there's too much familiarity, if there's a rational explanation, I think it really takes away from it. And... And it's not, you know, some movies definitely should have explanations. You know, The Thing and The Fly are both horror movies that really benefit from having a clear explanation. You know, sci-fi explanations, not stuff that's going to happen in real life, 
but a very clear explanation so you know what you're dealing with because the horror is not from the unfamiliarity it's actually more the you know the the fact that they know what they're dealing with actually makes it scarier and i don't think that would be the case here because at the end of the day i mean what what is it going to be he's joe jameson and you know he's 68 years old he's a trucker from georgia and i don't know he just got you know he just snapped one day it's just it's never going to be as compelling as simply not knowing like hypothetically you could read this movie as him being basically like the supernatural you know there's not really anything that suggests that but you know the way that he's able to always be near them and you know knows all these things about them it makes it feel like a supernatural almost like a you know like a, a vengeful god or something and I, I will say it was kind of funny when the you know the the they're trying to steal the car and this guy walks up and he's like, oh, you are you having trouble with your car? I got some jumper cables, you know, just like, fantastic. Uh, I think we got it. It's right, uh, you know. And, and like, Lewis has to try to, like, block, but without making it obvious that he's blocking. You know, just, yeah. And, you know, right as they manage to get the truck going, they drive out, you know, and the guy whose truck it is, comes out, oh, where are you going with my truck? You know, I will admit, the first time I saw that, I was like, oh shit, that's the driver, isn't it? The, the first guy who comes out, but oh, no, they're not. Let's see, and... I, I will say that it was legitimately intense when they couldn't quite get the, the right motel, and, I'm sorry, wait, is that where Jay Hernandez playing a... Ah, uh, hold on. He plays like a, a marine. Is that where he shows up? Or wait, is okay. The the MDB quote section says that he's on the radio at one point. No, wait. Yeah, that's definitely the. Yeah, this guy. This guy submitted the Jay Hernandez character, but these are definitely Lewis line yeah anyway and apparently Walton Goggins is uncredited but plays a cop I wish I had noticed him he you know he but he he definitely he can pass for a southern cop 100 percent right and the I, I don't wanna you know I, I get why he goes uncredited in the the movie but Matthew Kimbra is the physical presence of Rusty Nail. That's not actually Ted Levine. And he, let's see, he's acting 53 things and one upcoming. He's a uh, first assistant director, second unit on um, Chasing the White Dragon from 2008. Have I seen him in anything else? I, it doesn't look like it. He's in Catch Me If You Can. I don't remember. He plays a producer in Crocodile Dundee in Los Angeles. It's been forever since I watched that. Bartender in Aaron Brockovich. Firing Range Attendant in American Beauty. Alien High Roller in an episode... Season 3, Episode 6, The Abandoned episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Belay Guard in Fletch Lives. Wow, I mean, apparently he's been in a ton of things I've seen. I just don't really remember. No wonder he snapped. Started kidnapping 20-somethings. Anyway, I'm kidding. That's the character, not the person. Allegedly. Uh, let's see. But, but yeah, legitimately tense when they can't find the right motel. And it's like, I, we've seen... Oh, wait, there's another one right across the street, you know. And the thing with, you know, do not be one minute late. And the shotgun trap thing where if you open the door, it'll, it'll you know, blow her head off. 
that was very, very intense. And I really appreciate that, like, I've seen movies that have that kind of thing, and they get almost no tension out of it. It's just, oh, look, we blew a guy's head off. Isn't that cool? And it's like, mm. if you're not, like, it, I, do, I don't think that's as interesting as the tension and suspense. This movie gets so much out of that. And I, I, I think if they got one or two minutes more, it would have felt excessive. It would have felt, okay, you're milking it, stop. But they, they handle it just right. It's so, like, because you spend, like, maybe ten minutes of a movie just worried that someone's going to open that door and, and blow her head off. And, you know, she, it keeps cutting to her, like, trying to get the, you know, trying, yeah, trying to free herself but not quite able to. Let's see. And... Yeah, and the the pipe through the leg of of um, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name Fuller. Let's see, and the the <laughs> the truck hits the motel. It's just it's amazing. It's completely absurd. How could the mo how could it possibly ram through? You know, obviously the real life explanation is well they built you know they built something frail that they could slam a truck through. But just, I love how nonsensical it really just, yeah, you know, smashes through the thing and, you know, they, the, the cops do manage to, you know, they, they manage to be useful for just a tiny little bit, you know, here at the very end, um, where, the, yeah, they, they fire a bunch of shots and into the, the cab of the truck and, you know, apparently, like, based on the very ending, I guess... Rusty Nail, like, forced him to sit there and drive the truck. You know, yeah, we realized the ice trucker was framed. And Rusty Nail is back on the CB radio talking about, I look forward to the rain. Keeps people inside. Washes everything clean. Just, just the exact right way to, to end the movie. I really don't think... Any ending that, and I'll, I'll acknowledge, I haven't watched, I don't have access to the deleted scenes and such, but I don't think I would find them as compelling as him surviving and still being out there. And I'll say, you know, I didn't even realize until researching for this video that there were sequels. It never occurred to me that there would be sequels to this movie. I always just thought of it as just, you know, you got away this time. Do not fuck with a guy like this ever again, or you might not, you know. But yeah, the, the two sequels are from 2008 and 2014, Deadhead and Roadkill, which raises the question, is the third movie in the UK and Australia simply called Roadkill 3 Roadkill? Now I gotta... I, I'll, I won't spend forever looking it up, but just... I can't help but wonder if... Let's see, so no, in Australia it is called Joyride Three. What about UK? Also, Joyride Three Roadkill. So I guess by then they came around on it, maybe. But um, yeah, those were my the the ones from during watching, and that brings us to the final section: notes taken before watching. So I realized not every single Lily Sobieski movie can let her be a complete badass, but that doesn't stop me from being kind of disappointed whenever I see something that could have fitted in that doesn't allow her to be a complete badass, and this could have fit it in. Like, you can... Like, she, we, we really don't know very much about her. She's a very... very bland character that, like, it's, it's you know, they're... They give her... Most of the traits she has are stuff that, like, your stereotypical macho douchebag guy is going to be attracted to, and, like, not quite anything. You know, she never talks about flowers or marriage or kids. She drinks, and she can tie a cherry stem in a knot with her tongue, and, you know, all these things that just... She's the cool girl. She does seem to... You know, she expresses some empathy towards Rusty Nails, but I couldn't really tell if that was just... I mean, we have to remember, she is being hunted along with the, the two guys. You know, she might just be, like, hoping that that will, like, 
get him off their backs. It doesn't mean that she would empathize with him other than, you know, it's just, like, that's her response to the situation. That doesn't tell us very much about her as a person. You know, it's also that she's coming into it very late and with new eyes. You know, they've been... Yeah, so, so uh, you know, you could easily see how... Especially considering that he already has Charlotte. Like, she could have been part of the climax, an active part of the climax. She could have been going around busting down doors or something, you know, but... She's a woman, They this movie doesn't think very highly of women, so that's what happens instead. Something I do really appreciate, this is from IMDb Trivia. To avoid the unpleasant effects of having to remove scotch tape from Lulu Sobieski's hair and skin after the take, she was tied up with a strong, thick plastic film, like thick saran wrap, which looked like tape and stuck almost like tape, but which was glueless, making its removal simple and fuss-free, which... You know, considering, like, a lot of her face, you know, yeah. A lot of her skin is, is covered with this. And, and yeah, you know, if you've ever had scotch tape on and, and tried to rip, a, rip it off, it's very un, unpleasant, you know. And maybe that's why, like, every time, you know, I've, I've seen movies where, like, a character will be taped, you know, the mouth will be covered in tape or something, and someone will will be a douche in the in the reviews section and be like, oh, you know, you could just like, if you if you use your tongue, you could remove it. Maybe they don't want the the unpleasant effects of removing tape. Now, let's see. Yeah. So I already mentioned some of the inexplicable things. Um, yeah, one, one reviewer said the trucker not only seemed to be able to appear in more than one place at a time. I'm not sure I can think of any time that that's... But anyway, but he was also capable of anticipating everything in advance. That is very true. It's And it's the kind of thing that's either going to bug you or you're really going to, you know, get into. So, um... Hit me up in the comments. Let me know what is your favorite movie that is somewhat similar to this. Um, do you think that something significant should have been changed about this movie? And if so, what? I'd love to debate that. If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two more links to stuff like my own playlist. A suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiled thoughts on a movie. Let's see, also one on the most recent, recently aired episode of the Disney Plus Star Wars show, Ahsoka. One on the most recent episode, I've personally gotten around to watching, of Screen Queens. Same thing for The Bear. I do a daily video talking about a Marvel show right now. It is the 90s animated X-Men show. And let's see, yeah, and recently the Ruin Thought, Thoughts video is talking about very similar to this one. In other words, if more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back channel, catalog as well as catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching the recording, and I will catch you next time. Breaker, breaker.